A group of us attended a summit at UC Davis on November 18th and 19th. The event was organized by VL2 in Washington, D.C. VL2 is the Visual Language and Visual Learning uh, organization, and it was funded by the National Science Foundation. The focus of this summit was on mind and brain and visual language. There was, it was attended by researchers, teachers, policy makers, and we all attended and were bombarded with a lot of information and we selected some that we thought would apply to the classroom in teaching deaf children. There's been research out there that has discouraged the teaching of two languages to children, that it puts a burden on the children. However, Laura Ann Petito's recent research indicates that that is not true, that they benefit from being bilingual. However, the age of exposure, the younger the better, is critical. And teaching in a 50-50 manner, both languages, allows them to be proficient bilinguals. Her research investigates sequential and simultaneous learning of language and finds that providing both at the same time at a young age, contrary to common belief, is the most beneficial. Her research was conducted on hearing bilingual children, so I've been asked how do you provide English to deaf babies at a young age, and she recommended fingerspelling. One presenter, Dr. Brooks, investigated eye gaze regarding social understanding. Her research with hearing one-year-old children included sitting across from them and then turning her head to look at something, and she found the baby would also turn their head and follow her gaze. However, she found that if she closed her eyes and turned her head, the babies would not follow her head shift. And so that essentially shows that Babies understand that I, the eyes are essential for getting information. Dr. Singleton also did related research on eye gaze and how social interaction affects the ability to gaze shift. Her research with deaf babies found that deaf babies with deaf parents are able to gaze shift, like watch the parent tell a story, look at the book, go back to the parent, <clears throat> and shift frequently and they found that those deaf babies of deaf parents did better. And the reason that that is important is that that actually leads to better executive functioning, which is, means better uh, problem solving and working memory. Dr. Peter Hauser also did research on executive function, and his research showed that those who are bilingual do better in gathering information and limiting information and in the end. So bilinguals essentially have better executive function. When you're signing ASL, what does your brain look like? It, ASL activates the right and left parts of the brain. However, when you're reading, it activates the left interior frontal cortex, as does fingerspelling, activates the same area. This indicates that both fingerspelling and reading are strongly linked and provide support to each other. It's fascinating. Does fingerspelling and print reading have a connection? So there's been research and experiments done, and they found that there's two groups, orthography and phonology. The orthographic approach splits the word into letters to become a word. So it's split based on the structure. So for example, thunder is broken down into thund er to come up with thunder. And the phonological way is based on sound. Thun der. So do the deaf and hearing do it the same way? We don't know. But with research, it's found that the deaf actually process it the same way as hearing people do when they read. So deaf people prefer to use the orthographic way for reading, for thund er to make those connections, whereas for fingerspelling, the deaf people tend to prefer the phonological approach, for thund for fingerspelling. 
So there is the strong connection between visual language and fingerspelling in learning to read for deaf children. All along, research out in the field really isn't connected to the classroom. So at the summit convention, it's been recognized, so they asked for a panel. So there was four of us on the panel from a variety of schools. I come from the School for the Deaf, and the other three are from the mainstream programs. And they wanted our interpretation of the research out in the field and how it is that we apply it in the classroom. And the four of us agreed that the research isn't strongly connected to the classroom, and we had to navigate through the information and make it fit the classroom. So we recommend that the research questions and the ideas are more focused into the classroom. So let's work with the teachers and they seem to be accepted, accepting that idea. So you've been watching the different summaries. If you are interested in more information, go ahead and approach these individuals. Also, the VL2 website will have video summaries by the different speakers as well.